Okay, so um, first off, uh, is anybody got any questions about the lab that we assigned last time on Tuesday? I looked at it, but I haven't started yet, if I'm going to be honest. <laughs> OK. Yeah, but, it's not um, due for a bit, but uh, I was just going to. But I, I have, uh, yeah, I did pull I, yeah, the instructions and pulled it up on my computer and was starting to look at it and separating stuff so my brain can work through it. Right. OK. Yeah, I, I, we're not going to go through it in um, step by step like we did with the other labs. Um, I've got other stuff we got to talk about going over VLANs today. So um, just wondered if anybody had any questions about it. Uh, yeah, I only had some minor issues. I was able to get the AWS setup done and I, I, I did a putty connection and, and, and did well. I, I did note uh, the following question in my mind as to whether or not we want to pursue setting up a, a, a GUI because AWS free tier stuff doesn't normally allow you to, or they don't give you a way to, to go GUI ready, but I, I believe there's ways you can do it. But, but all you're after basically is, is snaps of the connection. And I think I had some minor issue in putting the open VPN uh, application on the Windows box, but it seemed to come up on the phone. Okay, so I, I, it's like I got a question, but I don't know what my question is yet until I try to, to solve the issue of, of just getting it. past the phone setup, so. Okay. Um, you, you can set up the GUI out of EC2. You just mm -hmm. need to um, install the like third-party software such as uh, VNC or TeamViewer or stuff like that. I use a VNC and it works just fine with the GUI version. Right. I think they. I think one of the articles I saw mentioned the, the Tiger VNC, and I've used VNC um, in years past, so that that shouldn't be tough, and that'll allow you to actually run the, the a GUI side of your Ubuntu. I've got the Ubuntu 20 with that, so. Um, you say that that's, that's not due for another, what, another week? Oh, yeah, a week, a week from today. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just remember, uh, if you want to look at a, a Linux box with a GUI, it's not like Windows. Right. Windows, the GUI just comes automatic, but you have to install the GUI. So you still have to go in with remote desktop, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, Secure Shell mm -hmm. and install the GUI, right? X Windows. Are, um, so once you put that in, then you can use VNC or you can use um, XRDP uh, based on specific ports that they use. You just got to open those up on the firewall, remember? And um, if it's different from what uh, we talked about the firewall, which is your uh, security group uh, and uh, an Amazon Web Services, and then you can just remote to it, your box, your Linux box with a GUI and then do everything you would normally if you were just right there in front of the box. Uh, working on it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, also, Mark, while I got you here, um, we had talked about doing quiz two um, or quiz three today. Are we still doing that or are we pushing that off till Tuesday? Yeah. So we're going to open up a quiz that is going to have uh, another 10 questions in it. And we'll just, it's just going to be open boat, open note, open book uh, from everything we've talked about. We're going to have questions that uh, we've talked about in class. It shouldn't be too hard. And just take it some time between uh, now and uh, we'll just uh, give you a week to take that. And we'll just close it down like next Thursday. And um, you'll just have 45 minutes to take it. Should be fine. Plenty of time to take it. Um, and so that should be opened up uh, this evening then. All right. That was the only two uh, pieces of business I had to take care of before we start going into the new new subjects. Uh, we're talking about VLANs today. Um, so let me uh, pull up some slides here real quick. So VLANs, what exactly is a, a VLAN? It's a layer two technology. Um, it basically uh, attaches a number to packets that are being sent out uh, on your device, well, on the switch, uh, the VLANs actually, the tagging gets done at the switch level, switch and routers. Um, so your device doesn't really do much. Um, it possibly could if they installed some software for it, but they don't. So it's, it's like a switch and router uh, technology. But basically what it can do is it can 
segment your network for you um, <clears throat> uh, uh, in a logical manner rather than a physical manner. So, but it's, uh, it's specified by the IEEE 802.1Q specification. Um, you have access ports and you have trunk ports. Um, and the access ports, you can uh, identify an, a numerical identifier, call it a VLAN ID. Uh, and it's uh, anywhere from one to 4,093 uh, is the number. And it can be, you can pick any number you want. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't have to go in any order. Um, the only thing I would recommend you do is you tie that number in with uh, your IP addresses that you're going to use for that subnet, for that network. So that way it makes some sort of sense to you so that you can take a look at a IP address in your organization and go, oh, that's VLAN you know, 50 or VLAN 100 or whatever. Um, so, uh, but that's, that's the only limitation that there is and really that it's not a limitation. You can make them whatever you want. Uh, the uh, previous uh, network admin that used to work here, he had IP addresses of all different sorts uh, in the 172.16 range. And he had VLAN numbers from anything from uh, two to 1500. <laughs> and of course, 1500 is not going to make any sense in an IP address range set, uh, setting at all. So uh, uh, yeah, it was a little weird. So I've got that mostly straightened out to my own liking now. But uh, yeah, um, that's uh, one of my own little pet peeves. So um, and then VLAN IDs must be defined in the switch configuration before anything can happen. So you have to, there's a couple steps you have to take in order to uh, uh, configure VLANs on your switch and you have to do it on the router too. So, uh, and we'll get into that. Uh, so that's that's pretty much the, the gist of it as far as how they work. Let's do, let's look at some uh, graphics here. So here we have a picture of a segmented network, a physically segmented. So the router has individual ports. Each port has its own IP range, uh, pretty much how we've been doing things in, our, in this classroom, uh, in this class so far. Um, but what, so we have the dev departments here, we have the uh, production department here, we have the admins here. So what happens if, one of our admins needs to move his office over into the building that the, has the productions in it. We want him to be on the admin network. We don't want him on the production network. So how do we do that? So the reason, the way you do it is to have VLAN set up. So um, here, our next slide here. So on the switch, and this is how I like to think about it, is you can color each port with a certain VLAN ID. So in this case, these the red ones are um, 192, 168, 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2. So it's the 192, 168, 1 network. Um, and the blue ones are 192, 168, 2 network. So the way they have it split off here without this router here, don't pay any attention to the router right now. The way they have it split off, these two networks cannot talk to each other. They are split off. It's all layer two technology. Um, you have to have a router in order to marry the two and, and be able to route between the two separate networks. So it's it's a an interesting way of um, managing the, the traffic and ports on your network. Uh, so that you can uh, split off uh, for not only security purposes, but also for uh, traffic shaping and um, uh, logical uh, purposes. So management purposes. So the way you, you put in the routing part of it is you have a router and you have sub interfaces configured on this one interface, physical interface. So you go into the router and you actually configure a, like for example, say this is gigabit zero slash zero, you actually configure gigabit zero slash zero dot one and gigabit zero slash zero slash two and uh, VLAN one and VLAN two accordingly. 
And then on the switch side, you have to have this one port that goes to this um, uh, router. You have to have that configured as trunk. So the trunk ports will, by default, uh, send all the different VLAN traffic through it. So it'll combine it all into one. Um, whereas access port will only transmit traffic on one particular VLAN. Does that make any sense so far? Am I going too fast? Questions? Here I, you know how I get it. I'm trying to, I always use that phrase, lock it down. But the way you've explained this is you could have like for the library, you could have like 20 computers in the library. And let's say that you decided to pick the ones near the window as a separate network. So you're port configuring them, but we're really not to consider the physicality as much as we're to figure out that you're rebranding or remasking that room full of computers to be separated logically, even though Correct. they may have uh, they may have direct physical linkage. You do have to establish from what you're showing me, you do have to establish a trunk for combined traffic and a location where you configure the separation into the to the sub ports. And then from there, then they're distributed accordingly uh, uh, to their to their IPs. So correct. OK. All right. Yep. Yep. You got it right. Um, and then, of course, uh, in your scenario there, uh, a lot of times in a building, you'll have um, multiple ports in a say an office and you'll have your computer plugged into one and um, so if, for example, you changed your port to another port, uh, it's possible for you to hop onto another VLAN if that port isn't configured for that VLAN anymore. So you, you can actually jump into, and that's a security problem, and there's ways to uh, mitigate that. Um, so yeah, um, the, the one method that is really good is to air gap those ports that are there extra. And then you, if you need to um, uh, make it hot, you have to go physically into the, the network cabinet and, and plug in a cable physically. Um, and that's one way of dealing with it. That's requires a lot of footwork. <laughs> uh, another way is to um, uh, logically shut down those ports and then enable them remotely. And that's a little less physical. <laughs> so everything is physically connected, but logically you've got that port shut down. So it doesn't, uh, uh, isn't um, active. I would like to However, ask you, I'm sorry, go ahead. Th yeah, that's going to require you to have very good documentation. So. You've eloquently set up our, our initial understanding of the VLAN, but I am peculiarly interested in, for example, when you walked in and saw that you had all those diverse IP ranges, Mm -hmm. And at that moment, you've decided I'm going to redesign this so that at least I have, as you pointed out, matching ranges per, per certain logical um, um, setups. Are you going to be able to show maybe a minor example of how you would correct that? Because whenever you're talking about configuration and, and resetting some of these IPs, it'd be nice to maybe see an example of, of how you'd flip a couple of machines to a different net. Sure. Yeah, in fact, we're, we're going to do that in just a minute here. Uh, I've got a, a packet tracer uh, and we're going to configure it on a live network. So, so um, any other questions before I move on from this one? No? Okay. All right. So this one is basically the same thing. It just gives you a more logical view of it. So you have several switches all connected to one router and they all share VLANs with each other. And then, so you have an engineering VLAN, you have a marketing VLAN and you have a, an accounting VLAN and one computer on each switch, separate switch. And that way you can have say a whole stack of switches in an office building. And there's one central location in the office called an MDF and that will main distribute data frame and then um, uh, and then your different departments can then be logically associated with ports on that switch so that way you can it's uh, easier to manage um, and it's just a matter of uh, plugging in a, a device and configuring the port for it now there are ways of doing what's called a NAC system which we have here on campus uh, called network access control and it actually will automatically change the port VLAN 
depending on what computer it sees on the switch. So it's a interesting system, but we're not going to go into that because it's a little more complex than we were already discussing here. And this is fairly complex as it is. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's pretty much that. Uh, so we'll have different switches attached to one router and we have different uh, computers attached to that switch. So let's pull up my packet tracer here. All right, so there's two different ways you can do this. You can use a router, a straight up router, or you can use a layer three switch. The layer three switch is easier. There's less uh, devices in, the, in between. So when you're using a router, you have to use a layer two switch to connect everything. Whereas the layer three switch has all the uh, ports and everything, all the configurations all in one box. So what I've gotten uh, set up here, I've got a DHCP server and it's uh, sending out uh, packets. Uh, right now, these um, desktops have uh, good IPs or at least they should, yep. So 192.168.2.52. So if you noticed, I've made VLAN 1, 192.168.2.0 slash 24. And the DHCP server is 2.2. So these are all being served DHCP on VLAN 1. Now here would be an example of where the VLAN number does not match anything in this uh, IP range. And I did that on purpose because I've got it matching over here and I didn't want to mix up my numbers. So, um, so in this one instance, I, I broke my own rule. But if you notice the next VLAN that we're gonna set up, we have 103, which would be 192.168.103.0. And we have 104, which would be 192.168.104.0. So, and that would give us 254 computers on each of those uh, VLANs. Of course, we've only got 24 ports on our switch. So, <laughs> you know, we, we can't put that many computers on there, but it makes the numbering easier. Now we could add more switches to this one router and branch off from there, make uh, another switch over here and add more computers to it. Uh, another switch over here and add more computers to it, so on. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into the actual switch. And uh, I'll show you, this one just has stock configuration on it so far. Nothing fancy on it whatsoever. However, if you notice this interface VLAN one, and it has no IP address and it's shut down. This here is um, the configuration for managing this layer two switch. On a layer three switch, this would be how you set up other VLAN. So you'd have interface VLAN, say 100 or interface VLAN 101, that type of thing. But on a layer two, it's just interface VLAN one. Uh, the default VLAN that Cisco switches come with is VLAN 1. And I think that's pretty much true with any other manufacturer out there. It's all pretty much VLAN 1. You can set your default um, a VLAN to be something else, your native VLAN, they call it. Um, you can set it to something else if you like, uh, but by default, it's VLAN 1. And then also by default, all of the interfaces are all set to access VLAN 1. So, um, and you can't see it because it's the default, but if I were to type in, well, we'll, we'll go into it in a minute. Um, so let's, let's configure some VLANs on here. So you go to config T and configuring a VLAN on uh, layer two switch is simple. You just type in VLAN and then the number 103. Done, easy peasy. Now there are some other commands you can do after that because that's why they give you this config VLAN. You can do a question mark and you can give it a name or no name and then a remote span. But uh, most people don't use remote span. That's a switch port analyzer. So anyway, so it's just a name basically is all you can do. So, but I, I'm not sure what we're gonna name these. So I'm not gonna name it. You don't have to name it, it's an option. It's just for your own documentation. 
And when you get into VLANs, it's very important to document what you've done and how you're doing things because it can get uh, confusing pretty quickly. Oops, I'm typing the wrong thing. So VLAN 104. And then you can continue as well. You can type in as many numbers as you want. Like I said, they're one through 4,094 uh, different VLANs. And if you want to see what VLANs are configured, you just do show VLAN from the, uh, the uh, oh, I can't remember what mode that is. It's not config mode, it's the other one. But as you can see here, VLAN one, all the ports one through 24 and gig one and gig two are all access one ports at the moment. But we have VLAN 103 and VLAN 104 uh, in here. Also, if you notice, we have some others, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005. Those are also default VLAN values that have been there since the 90s and basically refuse to die. Uh, if you notice, we have token ring. <laughs> and I don't know anybody that uses token ring anymore. Um, same thing with FIDI. Uh, FIDI is a, a fiber optic um, type of network that isn't in use anymore, but it's still part of the default uh, configuration for uh, switches, just in case you have something out there that's really old. Um, but uh, so yeah, that, that's pretty much it as far as configuring a VLAN, but now we need to configure the ports for it. So um, privilege mode in this. But the pound sign is privilege mode. Privilege mode, that's it, yeah. Um, let's see here. So to see what you've got plugged in without hovering over it, you can do a show interface status. You can on the switches, on this on the routers, it's a different command. <clears throat> but you can see all of the different ports on here. So port one is connected, port two is connected, port 10 is connected, and port 17 is connected, and port gig one is connected. I know for a fact gig one is our uplink you know, to the router. So what we're gonna do, if you remember on that, that picture that I just showed you, with the uplink, it has to be a trunk port. So you go interface GI zero slash one and switch port mode trunk. Okay, and that will bounce the port. As you can see, it only made it go down as it configures it. And so um, uh, we gotta wait 30 seconds for it to pull back up. And then say I want this computer, uh, which is on, oops, I don't wanna click on that, which is on port 10. So interface FA zero slash 10, you do switch port mode access, and then switch port access VLAN. And let's put it on 103. Okay. And so now let's take a look at our config that we've done. So here we are interface FA zero slash 10. We have switch port access VLAN 103, switch port mode access. And then down on gigabit one, we have switch port mode trunk. And that's it for uh, configuring a VLAN on your switch. You can't communicate with anything because this is now on its own separate network. In fact, if you look in the config here, uh, if you do an IP config, uh, oh, it's still got the old one. See, now our DHCP request has failed because it doesn't know how to get there because it's now on a separate network. So it, it can't reach the DHCP server because it's not configured on this router yet. So, speaking of the router, let's uh, let's get into the router here, and I'll show you how to configure it from there. So let's do a show run just to show you what I've got configured on here so far. 
Um, I did make some configuration changes. I got the, uh, the link between here and here configured so that uh, uh, we don't have to get into that so much. But uh, we've got an IP address of 192.168.254.2 and the other side is dot one. And then I've got a default route going to dot one. 192.168.254.1. So basically, if it can't figure out where to go from itself, it'll just send all the traffic over to the other router, uh, which is fine for the, uh, the configuration that we've got here <clears throat> for our own lab setup. Um, so anyway, so other than that, it's pretty well bog stock. It's nothing, nothing fancy. So what we're gonna do is so that's on gigabit two. I think it's gigabit zero is where our uh, our link is. So you do a show IP interface brief, and that'll pull up all the different IP uh, different uh, interfaces that are on this router, and you can see that the status protocol is up. So this is the one that actually has something connected to it which would be our switch. So the way you configure this now, to use different uh, VLANs, you do interface GI zero slash zero dot one. And so now you've configured a sub interface of it. In fact, it says config sub IF, so sub interface. And now you want to do because the routers, they actually have, um, Cisco brought out their own proprietary uh, VLANs uh, setup a while back, back in the 90s. Uh, you can still use that setup, but the industry standard is the .802.1Q, is what it's called, 802.1Q. And um, so you have to do what's called encapsulation. So that's the way the official term for uh, using VLANs is encapsulation. So the command you use is encapsulation, and then you can do that. Uh, you can do uh, oh, in this case you can only do the dot one Q. So I'm not even sure why they still have this encapsulation command is still in here, but that's the only thing you can do is dot one Q. So encapsulation dot one Q. Oh, this is also where you specify which VLAN. So now you gotta put in the VLAN ID. So we're gonna do VLAN one because we did dot one. So, um, and again, these don't have to match this uh, zero zero dot one and uh, dot one Q dot one, but they don't have to match. You can make it something different, but I wouldn't recommend that. <coughs> um, so anyway, so then you can do IP address 192, 168, one, uh, two dot one, and then 255, 255, 255, zero. Just like the usual, except I, uh, there we go. And then of course you got to do a no shut, bring it up. And then we have to do, because we've configured 103, we need to make a, a sub interface of 103. So interface GI zero slash zero dot 103 and the new encapsulation dot one Q and then 103 for the VLAN number. And then IP address 192.168.103.0 then 255.255.255.0. Oh, I gotta do a dot one. So let's take a look at our configuration here real quick. So now under gigabit zero slash zero, so we get the, the actual interface and then we have interface zero slash zero dot one and zero slash zero dot one oh three. And then the encapsulation dot one Q native. So in other words, by default, it says it's native, but you can make it whatever you want to be the native VLAN, um, which will then change what the default VLAN is. Um, most times you don't want to do that, but maybe in a certain strange situation, you want to change it to something else. Um, 
And then of course the IP address associated with that, that uh, VLAN. So now we have a mapping of VLAN 1 to 192.168.2.1 and a mapping of 103 to 192.168.103.1. That makes sense. Hey Peter, you, you got my attention with the use of the native uh, uh, moniker there. Uh, in your own opinion, it, would there be a reason a particular VLAN should be chosen as native? And obviously, in this case for demonstration, we don't have to. But depending on how you maybe have multiple VLANs, is there one that you should make native in, in case there's issues? In a very very I, the only place I can think of would be either some sort of weird network setup to where you'd have to put a, the native VLAN on a different VLAN for some reason. Um, you know, something very strange that it wouldn't normally come up against, but or possibly a very high security environment that they don't want to have anything be the defaults because a, a hacker would know that VLAN 1 is the default. So therefore, you know, it's possible to do some sort of VLAN 1 hack. But okay. so then we're going to make everything VLAN 2 or 20 or whatever it is for the be the native VLAN. But again, that's very, very rare. And I don't know of anybody that would actually, I, I don't know of any hacks that uh, you require <laughs> do VLAN numbers. So but anyway, so uh, that would be the only reason I would think of to change it, uh, unless there's some sort of weird setup that you come across in some other uh, uh, sys uh, admin or a network admin has come by and he really liked native VLAN 20 and everything is set up on VLAN 20 and you're like, why? <laughs> you know, so. Well, in a sense, it kind of boils down to where native is not, you know, it, it's more like you don't want to point attention to anything important, but you just simply have to assign a number one and then go from there. So, right. I got you. All right. So now we should be able to go to our IP config and get a new address, but it's not working. Why is it not working? Of course, it's not working. Right. Let's try. So troubleshooting. Here is some real time troubleshooting. So we know we're on this network. So let's do. Let's set up by, uh, um, a uh, manual instead of DHCP. Ah, uh, maybe that's the problem. So it wasn't set up to DHCP. It was set up to static. No. Nope. It's still not working. Okay, so 192.168.103.say20. And then the submit mask at 250.250.0. Okay, so let's go back. Let's try to ping our default gateway. 192.168.103. And I can. So the router is responding to requests. It's going through the switch on VLAN 103, and the router is responding to requests. But for some reason, this switch, is, uh, this uh, DHCP server, ah, there we go. I know it's not what I did wrong. So, so uh, uh, this goes back to one of our lessons that we uh, did uh, back a few weeks ago. What, does a DHCP request go across a router by default? No, that's exactly why. <laughs> so now I gotta put in a helper address. So that's the command I forgot. So I gotta go into interface gi 0 slash 0 0.103 and you do IP helper address. 192.168.2.2 is the uh, DHCP server. So now I should be able to go into config here and click DHCP and it should pop up with a DHCP. 
PHP settings, PHP, come on, there it goes. Now we've got ourselves a DHCP address. So I can do a IP config and then we've got 192.168.103.50. So DHCP handed me this address now. So if you want, I'll show you what the config looks like for this DHCP server and how I've got that set up. Let's see, are you on the, uh, the 3650? Is that where you're at, the layer three switch on the right? Um, when you put no, that I, I haven't been using that yet. Okay. The, uh, this, the configuration is actually simpler for this. So I really like a layer three switch, but I'd I was going to go over the, uh, the router. Yeah. <clears throat> the way when you have a layer two switch and a router, the traditional um, way. what's that? Yeah. Traditional way, right? Traditional way. Yeah, well, traditional yeah. and, um, uh, Cisco calls it a, uh, router on a stick. So, because you have one connection here, so it looks like a lollipop, you know, the router on a stick, only one connection, but you have many networks running over that one connection. But anyway, so DHCP server. So I made multiple pools for the VLANs and just named them VLAN 101, 103, here's the 103. And I gave it an IP address of what it needs to start with and what the subnet mask is and the default gateway. I could put a DNS server if I wanted to in there, but basically I made a, a, pool, a pool for every VLAN network that we're gonna put in here that you could possibly get a um, DHCP address from. So now that, that makes it easy for us because if I wanna switch it to say, um, well, I haven't configured on the router yet. So let's, let's finish that. So let's do 104. By the way, all this has to be done through the command line. <laughs> Sorry guys, <laughs> that's just the way it is. <laughs> um, so let's do 104. Interface GI 0 slash 0 dot 104. And then do encapsulation dot 1Q 104. And IP address 192.168.104.1.255.255.255.0. Now see, isn't that nice when you have everything kind of matching? It's all I have to remember is 104 and I can put all the commands in by my memory. So it's, it's much easier. Now, of course, I got to put in an IP helper address so that uh, DHCP can talk. And then of course do a no shut on that interface. And now it should be able to talk, Let's, uh, do a show run just to sh see. So we have the IP helper address here for 103 and now we have a 104. And everything looks good there. So 104, 104, and then the IP helper address of our DHCP server. So now I should be able to go to the switch and go config T. And remember what port that was on? That was a uh, port number, let's go back and I'll show. We'll show interface status. And if you notice, this is the only one that pops up as 103. So port 10 is connected, 103, and it's a uh, 10, 100 uh, connection. So, Big T interface FA zero slash 10. And then switch port access. So SW short for switch port and access VLAN. And let's make it 104 instead. So with one command, We have a, we still have an old address. So let's do an IP config new. Oh, my port's still down. So we have to wait for a minute. Hit the double arrows down the bottom right there. And cheat key. Yeah, that works. Yeah, it's a little cheat to jump ahead to time to. Yeah. 
So let's do our new now and see what happens here. There we go. So now I've got a new address, 192.168.104.50. Just like that, one command, and I'm on an inst instantly on a different network. And I'm able to route through um, to this other switch even. Um, so I could ping 192.168.24.1, I believe. Oh, maybe not. Oh, there it goes. It just took a minute. Oh. So now we have this router hooked up to these VLANs. We have this switch hooked up to these VLANs. DHCP server all talking to everybody. Everybody's all happy. I could put uh, multiple ports on the, uh, the switch. In fact, it looks like it does a show interface status right there for us. Um, so like uh, 17, I can't move my mouse, but if you look on there like 17, we could make that 103 and uh, put them on a different network if you wanted. Um, what you don't want to do is change your DHCP server because <laughs> that's going to break everybody. But what you could do is, yeah, you could switch your DHCP server like um, to a different VLAN. Um, so for example, um, now let's see what the, uh, so it's port two on the switch. So it's port two, FA zero slash two, and then switch port mode access, switch port, access, VLAN, and we'll say 103. Okay, so now I've disabled my DHCP server for a minute, but what you can do is you can go in here to the DHCP config, and on the interface, you set it to, um, well, the default gateway would be 103.1, and then the IP address would be 103.2. And so now that can talk on that VLAN, but now you gotta go in here and you gotta change your IP helper addresses on those two VLANs in order for it to speak. So is anybody confused at this point by what we're doing? This makes perfect sense. Oh, I, I wouldn't say that, Mark. Um, I am going to have to do a lot of uh, re repetitive keystroking to make sure that when you're dropping in and out of configurations, that's probably my, my worst issue is to keeping track of where I am in that list. Every time you drop up a level or down a level. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I mean, it just, it's about just practice and knowing where, where I'm at. Yeah, knowing where yeah. you're at the, in these sub interfaces, there's a sub and there's a sub sub interface, you know, so you, uh, okay. So no, I asked you of you. So uh, Daniel Rivera, what is a trunk port? I unfortunately haven't been able to keep track of everything. Okay. So, so if you can, just say, hey, I'm not tracking what's going on here, and then we can just step back. And don't worry about, hey, I, I won't say anything because I'll have to rewatch a lot like this activity and like on the channel again. So what what we're doing is if you if you move the PC4 config window out of the way so you can see just the, the link to the router there, then you've got Sorry. so what was what was three PCs on the left here. PC three, four, and five going to a switch. They were all talking to each other. They were all in the same virtual LAN, which was VLAN one or subnet or local area network. Those are all those were all synonymous at, at the beginning. And they had one connection to the router, that router three in the middle there, that 2911. But now 
if you thought of that PC3 on the third floor, PC4 on the fourth floor, PC5 on the fifth floor of a building, and each, each building had a different network per floor, then you, you were basically, um, they could all connect, uh, in this case, to the same switch. Um, but in effect, what he's done is he's created um, separate VLANs and uh, they're on different VLANs with um, uh, that they have to go back to the router, router three, and it um, encapsulates or does VLAN tagging, so it tags the traffic and separates it. They don't talk to you, don't they don't talk to each other directly on that switch, that uh, 2960 Cisco switch there, that 24 port switch they cannot talk to each other directly in fact they have to go back across the dotted line to the router to be routed to be sent back to the switch to talk to the other two pcs or a dhcp server um, on the left side so that's what he's done is he separated them into virtual lands they're on um and when that traffic goes to the router that interface it used to be just one router interface for one subnet is now three interfaces in one because he put it into a quote sub interface. So it's like that, it's called that trunk port is carrying traffic for three different networks back to the router three, routing it, even though it's even routing it within the same pipe and sending it back to the switch but tagging it to a different VLAN to go to a different PC uh, or a different floor or whatever in that case. So he separated those three into three subnets. Each of those three combining and just thinking three separate groups of traffic combining onto that dotted line to the router, uh, but separate from each other. They can't talk to each other directly unless they are routed through the router. That's what he's done there. That, does that help? Kind of, I, I, I definitely is part of it. But yeah, I'll have to look at the video. It's fine. Yeah. So yeah, the trunk port is what transmits all the VLAN traffic. Your computers are actually untagged. They have no VLAN information whatsoever. It's the ports on the switch that actually tag things for you. So uh, at, you know, it's, Two of these are VLAN 1, and one of these right now is VLAN 104. So the computer itself doesn't know that it's on VLAN 104. It just wants an IP address. So it's the switch that actually has that logic built in. And then the VLAN 104, it has to get to this router in order to be routed properly because it's on a separate network. Does that make sense? Yeah, and the tagging part is just that that's how it keeps track of what network traffic is coming through that, that dotted line to the router. So it's like, hey, here's VLAN tag 103 or tag 104 or whatever, 105 or, or two or whatever it was. So then you've got these tags that says this packet it's part of this VLAN and this packet's part of this VLAN. So as that traffic goes from the switch to the router, it's um, it's basically through it's it's basically is like if these were three different roads and now those the, the those or cars on a freeway and then all the cars merge onto the freeway, they're all different packets from different networks, but um, they're all on one big freeway, that dotted line back to the router but they are owned by different VLANs, that traffic. So then when it gets right. back to the router, the router separates it by the VLAN tag. Yeah. Think, think of it like uh, different colors of cars. All of the, all of the uh, uh, UPS cars are brown and all of the DHL uh, cars are red and or yellow. And uh, so they all run on the same highway, but um, they're different colors. So. FedEx is red. <laughs> uh, FedEx, yeah. 
What's DHL? All right. So let, let's move over to the layer three switch. So I wanted to show you the, the original way of doing this because it makes it a little easier to conceptualize what's going on logically. So we have the layer two uh, setup that is being separated out and then we have it combining back together with the router. Whereas with the layer three switch, everything happens all in one box. So it's a little harder to go, oh, that's what it's doing because it's all <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, in in one spot. So so let's let's get into this configuration. But it's easier to configure because it's only one, and you don't have to do all the encapsulation and everything. Um, so let's let's just do well. Let's get a lay of the land here first off. Let's do a show interface status. Let's see what it's got connected on it. We've got gig one gig 10 and gig 17. If I remember right, I've got gig one, gig 10 and gig 17 for all of that. And then TI 1024. Now, if you notice this is routed, I had to do a special configuration on that in order to get that to behave like a, like a routing port. Otherwise all of this stuff normally acts like a switch port. So it's, yeah, exactly. So, the configuration for it is very simple. So you do a VLAN, in this case, 100, and a VLAN 101 to just define the VLANs. So let's, let's confirm that. You do a show VLAN just like the other switch. And we have VLAN 1. Um, with all of these, I'm not sure why it's got 16 and 20 separated out, but whatever. But then we have uh, VLAN 100 and VLAN 101. And of course, all the other default older ones that are in there too. So, um, so now let's associate an IP address with those VLANs. So you do interface VLAN and then 10, well, let's do one first. Interface VLAN one. And IP address 192.168.1.0.255.255.255.0. Ah, I'm doing it again. I got to have an actual address, not the network address. And then it's help, helping to have an IP helper address 192.168.103.2. And then um, no shot. So we oh, quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just choosing random people. Uh, Nadine, what is the helper address for? What is he putting the helper address in there for? You're on mute, Nadine. Hi. Hello. Hello. I heard so, you. What was the address? Yeah. What What is he putting the helper address on for? What does that do? I do not remember what the helper address does. Okay. So the, the helper address, when he's putting it on this interface, um, when you need to get an IP address, you have to send a broadcast. And by default, a router blocks a broadcast. It cannot go any farther. But a helper address says, oh, for DHCP, I will send it on unicast or, you know, one-to-one. -one. I'll send it just a regular packet to that 192.168.103.2 address he's got there. And it'll make it all the way through the network to the DHCP server, and then you, and then the, the response back will then be come back to the router, which it'll it'll broadcast back to the PC to get a new IP address. So that's basically for a DHCP broadcast to get through the network because it's blocked otherwise. That's what that does. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. 
Right, Mark, so, just for clarification. Oh, I'm sorry, Peter. Uh, I was going to ask in, in conjunction with what he was talking about the helper address. There, there is this sense that it, it simply would go out and look for the DHCP, but the helper address wouldn't that also be for things where you you're you're asking it to go out and use some services, um, maybe not necessarily connected to the DHCP, or would that be wrong? Is it is it, in this particular case you're using it specifically to to hit the DHCP server, or would you do that in case you had to do any kind of remote connections or wanted another machine involved that was connected to your VLAN. I'm not sure I understand. Well, it was my impression in, 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 going, in, in trying to understand when, when you first mentioned helper addresses, maybe I associated it, but it was like saying, I'm going to tell you where to look for certain oh, things. Right. You know, to, yep. to, in, in this case, it's mostly, it's going to be able to broadcast and instantly be seen by the DHCP server. Um, anyway, but but I didn't know if that was its only intent was to make it visible, but maybe to also I, like, it, for example, UDP or some other things I'm trying to think out loud here, but um, the helper... uh, No, the, the DH, the helper address is specifically for DHCP. Okay. And, um, okay. Um, and so if, if this, the router sees a broadcast come in on that interface, it will automatically forward that broadcast over to the DHCP server. That's where the hangup was. Okay, that that's perfect. So it, it's it, it is making the broadcast visible, which then takes the appropriate path. Yep. So if you yeah, notice, it takes, a, it takes a broadcast and sends it instead of broadcast unicast. Okay. Right. Yeah. Transforms it into. And unicast. then of course, when the when the broadcast gets sent back, the DHCP server sends back that information. It forwards it back, and then it has to broadcast it back to the PC because the PC still doesn't have an IP address, so it can only receive a broadcast. So right. again, it just broadcasts it back on that segment where it came from. Yep, Perfect. so it keeps track of where it came from uh, using a MAC address on the device. So because of the uh, configuration that I just put into the, the switch on VLAN one, because all of the computers on this segment or that are attached at the moment, or all VLAN one, I'm able to get a DHCP address in the range that we want here, 192.168.1.0. So let's configure. And so what we did for VLAN one is the same uh, setup for any of the other VLANs. So it's very simple. Just do interface VLAN, say 100. Okay. And then do IP address, give it an IP address, 192, 168.100.1, 255.255.255.0. .255 and then put that IP helper address in there so we can talk to DHCP, 192.168.103.2. And so, so there's none of that encapsulation, none of that jumping into other uh, boxes or anything. It's all the right there. So interface VLAN 101, IP address 2, 168.104.101.1, 255.255.255.0. The helper address two dot one sixty eight dot two no one oh three dot two and then shut. Now if you notice, I did this on purpose. I'm just gonna test you guys. Why won't one hundred work at the moment? Oh it actually uh I didn't need to put the no shut in there. It's uh yeah. If you if you scroll up. back up, if you scroll back up the to see the, um, you'll see that it, when you created it up at the oh, top. Oh, we brought it up. Yeah, it's a VLAN. And by it default, produced. see it says change state to up right there. I see that. And so it once you created it, it immediately did a no shut to bring it up administratively when you That's, have a layer uh, switch. That's yeah. interesting quirk of this particular layer three switch. Um, the ones I've worked on, you've had to manually put that in to bring it up. You have to put the no shut in there. 
uh, just like a router. Okay, so now we've got the configuration. Now it knows um, where to go with what VLAN. And uh, so, in fact, it even associated a MAC address with each of these. <clears throat> so now, if we want, we can say configure interface GI, uh, which one was it? I think it's 10, one slash zero slash 10. We'll do a switch port mode access, switch port access. VLAN, uh, let's say 100. So now that port has gone down and has to be bounced to, to new VLAN. And once it pops back up, I should be able to go in here and get the proper IP address. So at the moment, we got nothing. And if I'm impatient, I can click that and make it go faster. And I need to do our renew. And there it comes. So now we've got a 192.168.100.50 address. And that came from this DHCP server on the other side of the network. OK. So question here. Yeah. Uh, uh, Bryant Baumgartner. Why did he get a 100.50 address? Do you know, Bryant? Uh, I'm trying to look here. It was what was the what was the it was one hundred dot fifty or one fifty you said yeah one hundred dot uh, fifty yeah here I'll go back to this here it got a one ninety two one sixty eight one hundred dot fifty he's wondering why did that happen why did it get fifty I'm not I'm not sure okay. Hmm. Here, I'll show you the config for the DHCP server. So VLAN 100, the starting address is 100.50. So, so that range. It's the first one that came out through that range, it handed out 50. He had created all these VLANs in his <laughs> DHCP server and he created a range and he just determined it, even though it's a class C address. So it's 100, 254 usable addresses, you know, slash 24 mask or whatever. 255.255.255.0 is the, is the mask. He used one for the router, but for DHCP, when it does a DHCP broadcast to get an IP address, he says, you know what, I'm going to start from 50. And in fact, this just below it, three lines below the start IP address, it says maximum number of users. Uh, he could put in there 10 instead of 206. I don't know why it has 206. You see maximum number of users there, Peter? Yeah. Uh, go, uh, up that's... And, uh, go up and highlight that window where you actually make that change just to farther up, farther up. Up, up. You mean here? Uh, nope, up, up, up. Uh, oh, here, yeah. maximum number yeah. of users. See, oh, I, yeah, I could actually change that. Yeah, yeah, let's say he just put in 10 there. If he puts 10 in there, then he's only going to have 10 addresses in a pool for that subnet from 50 to 60. So he's going to get 50, 51, 52. When he gets to 60, that's it. That's all the IP addresses he can give out from this DHCP server. So these ranges are just arbitrary. He just made these ranges, whatever he wanted to make these. Yep. And um, uh, on these ranges, they're just standard class C addresses. So you've got 254 usable addresses uh, or three because one is the router 
zero is the is the cable address um, or network ID and 255 is the subnet broadcast. So he's created just a pool within that range of whatever he wanted. In this case, it's just one PC per subnet, but you know, if he was creating this for a, uh, a floor or a subnet or something in a building, he could determine that based on, on this setting here with the, in the service over on the left is DHCP and that's where he's creating these, uh, these pools. Yep. And this is how it's done in the real world. You, know, you have a DHCP server and it talks on all the different VLANs that are in your organization and uh, everything's set up on different networks and uh, then you just configure the devices accordingly and it all kind of works. So you're very so, easy to manage when it's like yeah. this. So, so gotcha. Micah, Go ahead. so question for Micah then, why did he choose these VLANs? VLAN 1, 103, 104, 100, 101, There's two VLAN. Oh, why did he why did he choose those VLANs? Micah, you're on mute. Well, it depends on resources, I would assume. Because I mean, you wouldn't want a collision between both of them. Right. They have to be in, unique. Yeah, in my um <clears throat> in that aspect. That's what I think. Is that right? I think I he was referring right. to why did I pick 100 as opposed to say 105 or oh. say 125. Um, for fun. <laughs> Actually, no. I, I, there's a real reason for it. This oh, number sure. right here okay. on I matched to this VLAN. You matched number. it, yeah. So if all of these networks start out 192.168, it's that third octet in that number that's really determining the true subnet. So if the router is you know, 192.168.100.1, that is the subnet 100. And so he just created a VLAN and named it the same name as his subnet. Those first two octets, 192.168, well, they're all 192.168, so that's not a differentiator. But the 100 is that third octet, the 100 or 101. So he matched those. Is that personal preference or is that organization or just, you both. have to do that? Oh, both. You don't okay. have to do that. You can make oh, these numbers any number between one and 4,093. Mm -hmm. So okay. you, can, you can make this literally 4092 if you want. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to, you know, sometimes you wonder, well, why did you do this? And, and so we're just trying to explain that. And then um, let's see, I'm just picking random names. Octavio. Did I already ask you, Octavio? Hmm? Did I ask you a question already? Not, Not today. yet. No. Okay. He's got a VLAN one over on the left, but he's got a VLAN one over on the right. How does he have two VLAN ones? I thought they had to be different. Do they have to be different? I would assume so. And from what it looks like they're using a slightly different range. Yes. Yes, one, there are two VLAN ones. He named them that. They're on two different switches. And you can have the same VLAN names on different switches, but they can't have the same IP range. Correct. He's got VLAN one on the right is actually the one net, 192.168.1. That, you know, zero through 255. But over on the left, that's the two net. See that? So he should have maybe said VLAN two over there, but it doesn't matter because the default, the default VLAN is one. VLAN one on a switch for all the ports. Right. So I could have put VLAN two on here as the default uh, and changed all of the ports to that default, but uh, I just, I was lazy. 
So didn't have a lot of time. So I, I left both of them as VLAN one. Plus it makes a good object lesson that you can have these numbers the same um, on your network, um, and but with different IP addresses because yeah, it's a different range, layer. Yeah, the range behind it has to be different. You cannot have the same, you can't duplicate or overlap because then it's like, no, it's not gonna work because you've already right. defined that over here. If I may, Mark, you just put a question in my mind that if he does have them labeled separately, does that mean that the two nets are going to be able to see or share traffic uh, response and requests because they are under the same VLAN, or does it, or is it still going to be separated only by its its uh, subnet numbers? It's separated okay, so because. Go ahead, Peter. Okay, so if you have two ports on the same VLAN, but they're set with different IP addresses. They won't be able to talk to each other. Okay. They will, that's a mix, misconfiguration at that point. Okay. If you're not on the right network, whatever network that is. Do you have time for another follow up question that kind of goes along with what you were looking at on the layer three switch? I know that in that demonstration, you guys revealed that there was a default on the no shut. Uh, command. And, and I, so I had two things is that you've revealed that on a layer three switch, it may actually have different default or you know, uh, other types of commands that you're not normally gonna be able to see with a regular AT&T layer two. You, you, you should expect that there might be some minor differences in the layer three. Um, the second kind of question is about the no shut command. Is its main purpose to simply reactivate the interface? When, when, Cause I, I'm, I'm thinking about what happens when you go into a configuration mode. Um, are you physically shutting the switch off? And of course the no shut is the thing that you're going to say that says, okay, interface, come back on. We're, we're, we're coming out of the configuration. So I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of that since I, I think I missed a couple of rounds when you guys covered that. Nope. Uh, so a layer three switch, uh, basically it's a layer two switch and a router combined all in one. And so you'll have configurations like for a router, which is what we have here. And you'll also have configurations for all right, where did it go? No, I have to do a new one. And you'll have configurations for switch ports, like a layer two switch, all in the same device. And so it makes configuration a lot easier. Um, the main difference I've found between a layer three switch and a router, because the layer three switch will actually do your routing protocols and everything, but the main difference I've seen is they don't do NAT the same way. Uh, so it's more limited on the layer three switch side. In fact, some of them don't even do NAT, whereas a router will do the full NAT uh, capabilities. Um, and we haven't discussed NAT too much, but uh, it's uh, pretty important in today's world to uh, translate your addresses to a public address or a private. Yeah. No, no. Network address translation, taking a private address, a private range, and then converting it to a public so you can get access to the internet. Yep. And, and this then, 192, 168, is that a public or a private range? So who'd you call on? So Kyle. Kyle DeSantos. What was the question? Is 192, 168, these ranges, 192, 168, are those public or private ranges? Um, I'm just going to guess. Uh, I'm going to go with public. Or... Yeah, so those are private ranges. Okay. Those are, there's a range that's private in each. Uh, do you remember when we talked about IP addresses, uh, class A, B, and C? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a, a 10 net, that's the class A private. The class B is uh, 172.16 through 172.31. And then the class C private is the 192.168 range. And those ranges are allowed to be used within a company or a school or your subnet or your lab or something, but they don't route out to the internet, they get blocked. And so that's why network address translation is required because if you have anything in that range, 
it's going to block it. So NAT, Network Address Translation, will take those private ranges and convert them to a public IP address, which means you have to have a pool of public addresses to get out on the internet. Otherwise, you're out of luck. So before we go, I uh, wanted to share one other thing with this uh, switch. So if you notice, this is a 3650 24 port layer three switch. And if you look under, yeah, it's under switches. This uh, 3560, right, no, 3650. So if you notice on this though, <clears throat> so if you go to the CLI, it says device must be powered on. And if you look closely, if you zoom in and you'll notice there's no power switch. So it's like, how do you turn it on? <laughs> so it took me a minute to figure it out. What you have to do is you have to add a power supply to it. That in the bottom. Like that. And that will the then boot it up. So now it's, it's reading an uh, image into the CLI now. And if you notice, it's actually got dual power supplies. So for redundancy purposes. I think the one on the you bottom. You only need one to power it on. I think What's the that, one on the bottom, bottom is the power supply. Yeah, you could drag it up from the bottom there. There's the, the icon is down at the bottom there. Uh, yeah, I guess it could have. So, but either way, he's right. Uh, by clicking on that, it, it displays it, the little icon down at the bottom. It's the same thing. And uh, it drops them in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, it took me a good five minutes to try to figure that one out. <laughs> okay, that leaves me with a great question that if you pick that switch, you got the two blanks for whether you want to put one or two power supplies. Is there anything in the operation of day to day that would give you indication that you need to boost it to a second power supply? Okay, so in a data center situation, you're going to want a dual power supplies on everything. So all your servers will have dual supplies, all your switches will have dual supplies. Um, any other device in your data center, you wanna have a redundant power supply for it. That way you can hook it up to redundant batteries, which will then go to redundant um, uh, uh, diesel generators. So in the case of anything goes wrong, you can still have power. Yeah, these two, these two power supplies have to go to two separate circuits. So you have to bring two separate power circuits with power strips into your rack from separate breakers. So that if one trips, you know, or whatever, you're drawing too much power and the breaker box trips that circuit, well, you still got power to the other power supply. That makes perfect yeah, sense about redundancy. So, you know, thank you. That you're right. That, that's perfect. So, yeah, that, that's pretty much it for the class today. Um, if you have any other questions, let us know. I'm going to post this packet tracer file now that we've completed it. I'm going to put that on Moodle in case you guys want to play with it. Um, but yeah, we're pretty well done for the day. Uh, do we have a link on Moodle where the, the recordings are as well, Peter? Yeah, at the very top, there's a, uh, I've got all the recordings in a YouTube channel, and there's a link to that YouTube channel. It says link to recorded classes. It's a third one down from announcements, Zoom link to the class, and then link to recorded classes. Okay. All right. Well, we let everybody go, and if people want to stay after and talk, feel free to stay after and talk, ask additional questions. Uh, we, we'll be here then. All right. Uh... So good job, Peter. I think that was a good explanation of VLANs. It is a confusing topic. It All is. of a sudden, those three PCs were talking to each other and now you've configured the switch and they're not talking. And the only way they talk to each other is they go to the router over that trunk port and back.
and get routed from one VLAN to another because you've configured it that way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's an interesting uh, scenario and it's hard. To, yeah. It's hard kind to of blows people's that. minds. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to visualize that, that literally it's like all the red and blue and yellow cars are getting on that dotted line to the router and they can't talk to each other unless they get, unless they get routed from one interface to another, which is a sub interface now, which is also a confusing thing because we've just talked about interface. One interface is one subnet or one network, but now you've got a sub interface, three sub interfaces or four actually in that 2911 router. And ultimately they're going to that routing to another sub interface being sent back uh, with another tag now because they're on a different VLAN coming back to the switch and then getting, you know what I mean? And then yep. getting sent. And then that tag is taken in the switch and sent to the port that's associated with that VLAN. And then the traffic gets sent to it. So it's this PC to the switch, switch to the router, router routing it, sending it back through the same line, back to the switch and the switch taking that tag traffic and pushing out the correct port. You know, guys, and looking at the way a hospital works or a prison or